All right, everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody, very much for your patience. Um, I'm Andrew Brand. I'm the director of threat research at Symantec, and uh, and obviously not uh, as much of a techie as I'd hoped I would be today. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the SSL visibility appliance. And unfortunately, um, although I have a demo unit here behind this uh, projector, uh, there is no uh, wired I internet drop in the crypto and privacy village. So. Uh, it is it is on and it is working. It's just not hooked up to anything. Uh, we can do a little bit of a demo with it uh, at the end if there's a little bit of time. Um, it, there are instructions here for like how to do the testing if you really wanted to do the testing, but it, it's not actually connected to any kind of a live internet service. So uh, while you can connect to it and you can dry, download these certs that I've generated by it, uh, you cannot really use them for anything. So just don't bother. All right. So. Um, going to talk a little bit about what uh, what the former blue coat now all part of the big happy semantic family is and uh, the division that I work in I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how this gizmo works and what it's meant to do um, also what it can't do and and because I use this in my lab uh, with a lot of different types of devices and a lot of different types of operating systems. Um, I, have a, I have some experience in, in what uh, is able to get through there and be decrypted what, and what the device basically causes everything to kind of choke on. Right. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to show you is going to be UI from the, uh, from the visibility appliance itself, which th it's not very pretty, um, but there is also uh, a component of this uh, a stack that I work with that's called security analytics and, and that's more important for me to sort of explain from the beginning because a lot of the packets that I look at uh, come out of SA. So the SSL visibility appliance essentially is this man in the middle decryptor that you would put between your WAN and your, and your LAN and you might use it for sort of two purposes. You might use it to man in the middle internal traffic that's outbound or uh, external traffic that's coming into a, a service that's got like SSL or TDS on, on the host. Um, when those packets come through the SSLV, it does it, it, if it can do its decryption, it will spew them out on uh, a separate port which you can then capture uh, with a span or a tap port and then uh, th that stuff gets ingested into security analytics. And what that does is records everything, indexes all the metadata out of those packets and then re-indexes that index. So the searching is really fast and you get something that's essentially a sim-like interface but when you drill down to like the, the nittiest of the nitty gritty, you can get down to the packet level, you can reconstruct files uh, from various types of uh, 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 applications that have been uh, uh, observed uh, communicating over your network. So HTTP, email, uh, a bunch of different types of uh, uh, protocols can be basically uh, decrypted and, and then reconstructed into a, a, essentially you can look like you're looking over the shoulder of the machine uh, that was doing the browsing or making the connections. Um, so what SA can do is it basically it can um, inspect tons and tons of traffic. It's meant for high speed sort of enterprise networks. Uh, it, it sort of com as a component of that, it, it uses a lot of storage. You can imagine, you just do the math on how fast the network is, what its typical load is, um, and uh, the number of days of storage you want to uh, be able to go back uh, retrospectively and do analysis on. And you can imagine we're talking, you know, we're in some cases into the uh, peta and exabyte amount of storage for, for some uh, applications. I run it on a virtual appliance because my network is relatively slow and with a, with a couple of gigs of, uh, of packet data plus the metadata, I'm, I'm usually able to go back three or four months uh, and, and reconstruct stuff uh, pretty far back. Um, so, and I've already talked about what SSL visibility is. It's, um, it really is just a, uh, it's, it's basically custom silicon dedicated to do the math that's involved in uh, SSL decryption. All right. So these are the sort of the two um, uh, ways that we would use SSLV. Most of the time that I'm using it in my lab, um, I am using it in the sort of outbound inspection uh, sort of variety, which is where I've got the thing. Uh, watching traffic, it's, 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 inside the, it's inside the LAN, but it's just inside the sort of the perimeter before everything else. 
and everything that goes outbound is going through this thing and when it can be inspected, it is inspected and when it causes problems, uh, you can, you, basically you can tell it to do one of two things. You can either have it reject that connection and basically kill it in which case uh, the application will throw errors if it's obviously not able to uh, complete its communication or you can just tell the box if you identify this, this protocol or this particular service or this domain name or these IP ranges, uh, you can say um, just ignore uh, for the purposes of doing inspection these, these things that you have set up and then it will ignore that and everything will go through but you won't get the decrypted SSL either. All right, so when, when you first connect into the SSLV, the first thing that, that you see is that it has its own self-signed cert, um, obviously because you, you're, you know, all of these appliances are, are using SSL and that's pretty normal. Um, the cert looks like that. It actually has a common name of SSL uh, NGUI um, and it's generated the first time you use the app. So this is the dashboard of the SSLV. Um, it, it has a, that's the prettiest picture that you're ever going to see in the UI. And um, all it does is it shows you a sort of representation visually of the rack and the ports that are on the front of it. And yeah, it's the one device that I have in my stack where the ports are on the front, everything else is on the back, so it's kind of a pain. Um, and it will tell you basically how you're using it. Um, in this case, I'm using it in something called active F line, uh, active inline FTN mode, uh, and that is where uh, all sessions are basically being intercepted. When they can be decrypted, it, it is doing so, and when they cannot, it, it essentially lets them go through un, uh, without trying to decrypt them, uh, just to allow things to work. Um, Sorry that that's so tiny, but this is just a picture of the user interface of the SSL session log. And what's important about this is that it will tell you, uh, for example, what cipher suite the device is, uh, is trying to decrypt. Um, if that type of uh, cipher suite is supported by the device, not all of them are, but many of them are. Um, and then whether or not it was able to successfully decrypt it. When it uh, is not able to decrypt it and the device allows the connection to go through anyway, so it still works, uh, that is called a cut through. And, and um, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the, one of the ways that the device works is that you have, you know, clearly you have one ethernet is for in and one is for out. And then there is a second pair of ports. It is literally, a, it is a physical loop back where you have to have the tiniest cable in the world and it's just a loop between them. And the reason for that is the, the device will programmatically decide when something is supposed to go through and it will literally shunt it through this other thing, which is just a loop to get it around all of the, uh, the silicon inside. Um, so to use it, you basically generate a cert, and the cert is generated, essentially the device acts as like a, a certificate authority, so uh, it will generate a cert for you, you can add all of the, you know, custom information that you would want into the certificate. Uh, this is not a, uh, you know, a valid cert that you would be able to then put up on your, uh, your, you know, HTTPS server, so um, it is, it is literally uh, its only purpose is to do the re-signing. Um, so the, the secret key remains within uh, the, the device and then you can export the, uh, the sort of the public side of the cert which you can then add into the certificate store of any of your devices. And when, when that cert is in the cert store, the re-signing happens essentially transparently and automatically. Um, there's a huge number of protocols that it supports. It's just uh, some screenshots of some of the, the UI dropdowns that show you all the different options that you can have when you generate your cert. Right, and then, um, you know, here's the, the exported cert. It shows, like, you can create one, like, this one that says, I call this my DEF CON certificate, and uh, it will export it as a PEM or a CRT or CER or DER, and then you can, you know, import it into a variety of different devices. All right. And then here's just the uh, the, the re-signing uh, re authorities are basically like, you know, you can decide under certain circumstances when such and such cipher suite is being used, use this certificate authority or else use this other one. And it's a way of basically, you know, you can use it for a bunch of different reasons, but it's a, primarily a way of maintaining the same security level of the traffic on your internal network. So you're not basically using a weakened cipher or something that's easy to crack inside the building because that would be, you know, talk about crunchy outside and soft and chewy on the inside. It's just, it would just make things worse for a lot of, uh, a lot of things. 
right? And then once you have your um, once you have your certs set up and they've been installed on your devices, then you have to create rule sets where you basically say under these circumstances you're going to do the the decrypting, right? And so you go to this rule policies menu, you go to rule sets, and you kind of add in your rule. And, and in this case, the rule sets that I've created are, you know, basically uh, look at everything and then if you see these domain names, exclude them. If you see these IP addresses which happen to be internal devices, exclude them. If you see these IP addresses that belong to, you know, uh, Netflix's, uh, uh, you know, content management system, exclude them because Netflix for some reason doesn't like to have all of their stuff decrypted. Um, and then, you know, and so on and so forth. And then the very last step is do the decryption. Right. Um, so one of the cool features that is in the sort of newer version of this product is that um, it, it pulls down and, and uh, ties in with the categories that, that Bluecode has created for its, uh, its web categorization service that sort of underlies a lot of their other products. That, um, most people know that Bluecode Proxy is, is the big enterprise product that a lot of people have and they have these categories where administrators can set up policies where they don't want employees to visit porn sites on the job. I mean, shocking, right? But like you might not want to block that. And so in this case, you can actually use those same categories and you can say, uh, I want to decrypt everything except stuff that's tied to banking and financial, for example. And there, thereby you can exclude the stuff that would basically make you, you know, would force you to violate, um, uh, you know, PCI DSS standards, for example, and you know, would you accidentally be, you know, leaking tons of data across your network decrypted that you wouldn't want to, to be leaked. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's, and, I, and the team I work for is the team that creates that and maintains that reputation service. They're, it's called the Global Information Network. Um, once you've done all that, then you, you just kind of, you know, pop it in and there's a little UI that says, you know, plug this into port one and two, plug this into port five and six, and then everything else, the tap is coming out of the other ports. Right. More, more little choosers that show you different combinations of things you can do. Um, so one of the things that it can do is also if, if the, because it's an inline box, it's a, it's a bump in the wire. Uh, you would imagine that if there were a physical failure like a power outage, you, your network might go down if this box wasn't turned on. So there's this concept of uh, fail to network and that, that's one of the other reasons why there's that little loopback physical wire in there is that it will, it will f actually physically click over. You'll hear a loud click when the power goes out and then that just means that it, it acts as a bump in the wire with nothing in between it so your network continues running even though the power's out. Right, here's um, some of the rules and the failure modes uh, that it can experience and what you can choose to do with it. Basically, you can either choose to reject, which means kill the connection, or you can tell it to cut through, which means let it go and it's not decrypting anything. Right, um, and I, we've already talked about this, you saw that graphic, so I'm not going to repeat all that. Um, it does not get used in a couple of different circumstances. So um, last year I gave this talk and, and uh, it was, there's been some misunderstanding about like the purpose of this device and it, it is not something, while it is suitable for enterprise networks where you may have a, a couple to 10,000 machines on a network, um, at the highest end, uh, it, it, in sort of like anything bigger than that, you're going to run into real problems where the CPU load is just going to be too high for the device and it's going to start dropping sessions. So this is not a box that you can plug in on your country's WAN connection to the rest of the internet and basically decrypt everything that everyone is doing. The other thing that you can't do is you can't decrypt stuff and have it not be really obvious. Everything that gets decrypted, if it doesn't have your CA cert in your cert store, is basically going to cause errors to pop up in whatever application you use. If you're using the browser, you'll see those messages that pop up that say, uh, there's something hinky about this HTTPS connection. Uh, do you, are you sure you want to connect to it? And so um, if you don't have that CA cert installed, it's going to throw a lot of those errors and, and there are going to be devices and, and applications that don't connect at all. Um, right, and that's, that's basically what I was saying is that, you know, none of this stuff is going to work if you don't have the CA cert on it. Um, 
when you do not when you do install CA certs on a laptop, there isn't necessarily a warning message to let you know that stuff is going to be decryptable. And and in some cases, we've seen. Well, they're kind of shoddy uh, crimeware uh, applications that have tried to convince people to install CA certs onto their uh, device so that the uh, criminal's malware can actually uh, decrypt the SSL for the criminal. Um, and other than that, I haven't seen a whole lot of criminal use of this type of thing. But when you do install the cert in other devices, like in Android, you get these persistent uh, alerts that never go away the entire time the cert is installed. So the only way to get these messages that say things like network may be monitored by an, uh, you know, an unknown third party, uh, you're going to see that message until you actually delete those certs completely out of the store. All right. So what's better in the past year? Um, I gave a talk similar to this last year, and the talk that I gave was about how um, how few applications for mobile devices specifically were actually using something called certificate pinning, where they, they essentially have a CA cert built into the app, and if that cert does not match identically to what it's getting, you know, in terms of the handshake from the server, the connection simply doesn't go through. And uh, a year ago, there were a few apps that um, essentially were, you know, very, very secure and would never allow that to go through, but a lot of other stuff did. Some of the apps that worked last year were um, that, that securely connected and had pin certs were things like, um, like the Twitter app, like Signal, the uh, uh, SMS replacement app, and, you know, other kinds of security tools that you can imagine would, would want to have pinned certs. Um, I believe also Facebook. Uh, supported pinning and, and a few games that do uh, uh, over HTTPS uh, some command and control for the game. Um, there's been a lot of improvements over the past year, so I, I kind of uh, I, I gave a, a different talk last year uh, about a game that I use that is a uh, location-based game called Ingress and how um, it is it has been and is continuing to be heavily abused by people who do man in the middle SSL interception to decrypt all of the command and control stuff and messaging that's in the game and that's being used to essentially louse up that game and cheat and um, I'm, I'm sad to say that 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 app has not improved, although um, the other game that that same company, uh, Niantic, makes, Pokemon Go, in a release that happened sometime in the last fall, uh, they did start pinning their certs. So while it is still possible to man in the middle uh, ingress, you cannot man in the middle Pokemon Go, to the best of my knowledge, unless you do some, some hacking of the app itself. Um, Right, and I mentioned that like basically when, it's, when a certificate is pinned that it's not going to work. I mean it's really not going to work. And, and, and a lot of times um, the application developers when they, when they create these apps that have pins in them, uh, they're, they're doing it so that they can ensure privacy of the connection, but they're not necessarily building in the, the error uh, responses to understand and explain to the end user why the thing isn't connecting. It will just say like tweets cannot be received at this time. So in some cases, you'll get these messages where it says it just couldn't connect. And in others, it will say, it looks like there's SSL interception going on. I'm definitely not going to connect. But a lot of the times, the, the error messages are pretty confusing. Um, so let me show you some of the other stuff that's popped out uh, just in doing a little bit of looking at devices. So, um, so what I haven't explained is sort of in, in my day job, uh, I, I run this lab. It's full of IoT devices. It's full of Android phones that are running malware uh, at any given time. Uh, I also have bare metal machines, virtual machines, and some sandboxes that are running malware. And the purpose of doing all of this decryption and, uh, and recording of network traffic is so that we in the gym team can observe the command and control traffic of malware, know where it's talking to, how it communicates, and write rules for various tools to either be able to uh, uh, notice when those kinds of connections are happening or to be able to block them by, by address or, or sometimes uh, to narrow it down to like the URI path 
uh, that, a, that a command and control connection would be happening on. So, um, so I do have a demo um, that was ready to go on my other laptop and hopefully I, if, if the person who loaned me their laptop doesn't mind, I might connect it to my demo network and see if I can do that at the end. Um, because I, there's, there is some malware that uses TLS to do its command and control. Uh, one of the, the primary ones that I'm seeing right now is a, a bot that's, that emerged in the last few months called TrickBot, which is starting to kind of gain traction as a, a, a main rat that people are, are distributing through a lot of different methods, but mainly through spam and through uh, 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 exploit kits. And it's, a, it's an interesting one because it's, it's also one of the more sophisticated and modular pieces of malware that I've seen. It, it, it basically is a, a core engine uh, for the malicious activity uh, and it brings down modules from different command and control servers so that it can, um, uh, it can run those modules as DLLs and kind of hook into different features on whatever machine it happens to have infected. So a couple of the weird things that have popped up recently. So um, it, like it, looking in these logs, uh, I will sometimes just kind of skim through them and there's, there's actually a filter thing that will trigger like just show you all the errors that appear in the SSL session logs. And so I like to look through those and just see sort of what broke recently. And I, I wanted to call a few of these out. So, so just last week I was looking at the, you know, a couple of these things and I had a machine, I had a phone that was attached to one of my, uh, uh, nodes in my network that is being, you know, go routes through this. And the phone was doing some just normal uh, activity, uh, but this error popped up um, and it's the one that's highlighted here and it was, it was a big log line so I split it in half, but basically at, at the very end, uh, you're near the end you can see it says expired. So the, the cert in this case, whoop, the cert in this case when this communication happened, it allowed the communication to go through. Um, it did not, uh, it was not able to decrypt it and it did report that the cert uh, was expired. So I went back in and I looked at, you could see that the, uh, the, the origin IP of this was uh, 54.208.220.185. So I went into security analytics and I pulled out the undecrypted um, flow that contained that session with the SSL stuff and then I used a tool called Network Miner to just like dump out the, uh, the cert and take a look at that. So when I did that, um, I found that there was this cert for something called parse.com and parse is, a, is one of many uh, different kinds of sort of mobile, uh, uh, it's instrumentation that developers will install, third party instrumentation package that they use to kind of keep track of how their app is behaving and it receives telemetry over HTTPS as well and their cert expired, it's hard to see but it says like it expired on June 29th so, so they were still running on an expired cert and, and I wasn't able to decrypt it um, uh, because of that. Um, the, one of the other things that I have, uh, like, I, like I mentioned, a lot of IoT devices and we have a, a couple of Samsung smart TVs, different models uh, connected to that network. Um, in general, the, uh, the Samsung is an interesting device because uh, it, I don't know, how many people, just show of hands, how many people have a Samsung smart TV? So it's just a few, but you know, more than, more than a couple. Um, interesting device. It has um, its own sort of version of, the, of, of an operating system. It has its own antivirus built into it as well. You can tell the thing to scan for files within the, uh, the operating system, uh, uh, file system. And it, uh, it has Ethernet ports and can connect over a wired or wireless connection and obviously you would then, you know, connect it to the network and it has, you know, all your apps for, you know, Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, whatever your video streaming service of choice is. Um, so when you want to watch HBO Go, you just go into the TV and you pivot over to the streaming service that you want and it launches an app within the TV um, and those apps are all downloaded through a cloud service that Samsung operates. Um, the TV also does things like it scans the whole network, oh, every, four times every second for Samsung, uh, uh, like mobile devices that can connect to the TV. Um, it generates a ton of noise and actually it's, I, I would say it's one of the reasons why when you buy a smart TV, it's always good to connect it to a power strip and when you turn it off, turn it off on the power strip so that it's not just sitting there. Because I've seen my TV stay active for three, four hours after you turn it off and it continues scanning looking for like, hey, does anyone want to connect and like share videos on the screen? Um, so it's pretty obnoxious. And, and in addition to all of that noise, 
uh, the TV itself has authentication with a, a Samsung account that you can set up uh, to do technical support and also to save your preferences. There's a browser built into the TV, so if you want to browse the internet, um, you can save your bookmarks in your Samsung account, and then when you log into your Samsung account on a different TV or a different device, basically you can get all that stuff back. Um, so what we've got here is logs from uh, the SSLV showing that um, the TV was going to a bunch of different websites including uh, SamsungCloudSolution.net and SamsungACR.com. Uh, all of these Samsung apps that are in the TV themselves, uh, with the exception of its Wi-Fi connection check, uh, they, all of them basically fail on this because they're using a pinned cert. That's good because the one that, that's connecting to um, SamsungACR.com uh, is, is connecting to something called logingestion.samsungacr.com. Um, the, the bad news is that um, all of those domains have invalid issuers. So, so there's a cert that was issued to these different TV connection domains that isn't valid. And when I pulled them out, I looked at them and yeah, they're all self-signed certs. So apparently Samsung operates its own internal certificate authority and they generate these certs for their devices which then get flashed into the firmware for the TVs and the, the, the mobile phones and everything else. And the cert has a you know, valid, val validity up until the end of the year 2043. So I cannot guarantee that your TV will still work in 2044. Uh, I suspect it will probably fail a lot sooner than that. But that, that's interesting to me to find out that like the big TV manufacturers are basically issuing self-signed certs for, for you know, the hundreds of thousands of TVs and things that they sell every year. Um, another thing that I was playing with was um, uh, my son's Nintendo 3DS. Uh, I do occasionally confiscate for like research purposes and play a little bit of Pokemon XY. But um, besides that, I'm, the, the device is actually really interesting because it can do peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking over Wi-Fi and uh, you know, so you can play basically uh, uh, collaborative games together with your buddies. Um, it also has its own built-in browser and, you can, and, and it, will, it, it kind of uh, tries as best it can to generate a mobile version of things like Gmail. So you can read your Gmail and stuff through the browser on the 3DS. I wouldn't recommend it, it's not the best way to read uh, your email. Um, and when you go to the browser and you have uh, SSL interception on it, you can see here it pops up a warning message that asks you to basically bypass the, the um, security features in the SSL. Are you sure you want to do this? It's essentially the same as what you would get in Chrome. Um, so in the browser of the 3DS, you can manually bypass this error message. And, and I don't know, show of hands, how many people think 10-year-olds understand what the context of this kind of a dialog box is? Exactly. So everybody, when your child is a, a straight A student in my book, that one guy in the back who raised his hand. So, um, so most kids are going to just hit allow because they don't understand what's going to happen. And um, I believe a lot of adults do that too when they see this kind of a message. So you can bypass and you can decrypt the SSL from the browser. Um, what you can't do without doing some serious modifications to the 3DS is you cannot decrypt any of the other HTTPS communications that the device does. So among those things, uh, there is a Nintendo account where you can create your me, uh, which is the little cartoony character that represents you in all the games, uh, and you can share your me through your Nintendo account with your buddies so that when they play uh, co-op with you, the, your me shows up on their device, their me shows up on your device. Um, so none of that uh, me, me gallery stuff works uh, if you have interception turned on. It just can't connect. Uh, the other thing that fails is um, uh, there is a online store where you can buy the games and uh, essentially download them to the device, to the SD card or, or into the device's memory. Um, this store app is also pinned so that when you have interception turned on, you're not going to be able to buy a game and download it. Um, and then the third thing that's kind of an issue is that um, all of the domains that are being used for Nintendo um, are also invalid issuers. So here I've got some of the screens. Uh, on this one at the very bottom, uh, it's the c.shop.nintendowifi.net uh, has an invalid issuer. And then on these two screens, there's uh, something called uh, nasc.nintendowifi.net 
and account.nintendo.net, and all of them are, is, are, are invalid issuers. And again, it's, um, it comes down to Nintendo themselves, just like Samsung, are operating their own certificate authority, and they're basically self-signing certs and throwing them into these devices. Um, I, you have to wonder about these large electronic manufacturers. I mean, I think that they probably have 50 bucks a year to throw at buying some certs. Um, I would hope that this would change in the future. I think right now it's probably being done for convenience sake, but it would be nice to see some trust levels in the SSL communications uh, and not just self-signed certs because this, as we all know, that's just asking for trouble. Uh, when you try to do um, anything over an intercepted network uh, through these pinned apps that are, that are built into the 3DS, you end up with a message that's very obscure looking and looks like this, uh, the one on the left that says an error has occurred, please try again later. When you go and you look up that error code, it, it tells you that there's, um, there's a message in that error code that essentially is that the clock is set wrong. So you need to check the time and then, and then uh, try to reconnect again. And that actually comes up a lot when, you, when you're seeing certificate re-signing is that the error is basically the same as if your clock was off and the timing for the cert uh, was, was wrong. Um, but, the, but the game developers or the, the device manufacturers don't as anticipate or assume that people are doing man in the middle decryption on their stuff. So they just basically have one error message for the whole, that whole type of thing. The one thing that does work though is when you do the connection test. So, so there is a, um, there's a whole Wi-Fi UI in the 3DS and you can connect to an access point and then it, it wants to go off and make sure that it can make a, a valid connection. If it cannot make an HTTPS connection, which it tries first, it then tries just an HTTP connection to a, to a URL that's on Nintendo's website. And when that works, it basically comes back and says your connection is good. But it doesn't tell you that you weren't able to connect over SSL. So um, yeah, it's just an, you know, another weirdness in a consumer electronics device. Um, another is invalid issuer problem that I found was with um, Whisper Systems. So Whisper Systems makes the uh, Signal app. Um, I'm a user of it, and you know I, I love Mo uh, Mar Moxie Marlin Spike, right? I mean he's been to DEF CON a million times and spoken, and he's a great guy, and this is a great app. Um, but once again, it's it's using a, a self-generated cert uh, to do that communication, and um, I just would prefer. I I don't know how you feel about it. I think it would be stronger if more of these companies uh, used certs that had some validity that can be uh, validated through a, a certificate authority. Um, so here's the Whisper Systems cert, right? And it says Windows did not have enough uh, information to verify the certificate. And at the bottom of the second one, it says the the issuer of the certificate could not be found. And that's basically the same error that the Nintendo one did and the Samsung one did. So probably, most likely, it was a self-signed cert. If I, if I had my laptop, I could open the cert and take a look and see what it was signed with. I don't have the screenshot up here. Um, right. Oh, so one of the other thing that uh, came out of this is that um, so the, the, there are these third-party apps, right? So you know Netflix and Hulu and all those guys have their own apps. They produce them for the Tizen operating system, which is the thing that's running in the Samsung TV. And then those apps can have their other like third-party instrumentation in them so that those app developers can get feedback directly from the TV user uh, when something's not working, if streaming's not coming through right. I mean, I, I, you can understand why you know, Netflix wants to know what your throughput is and if, so, if you're uh, getting too many artifacts in the video. And so there's all this internet um, uh, instrumentation built into uh, the, the apps themselves. And in this case, there was an invalid issuer for uh, Netflix's app. So there was a self-signed cert for Netflix's app, and then there was also something called Internet at dot TV, and that also was a self-signed cert. So that's whatever that is, and I'm not 100% sure what it is, because of course I wasn't able to inspect the content of the traffic uh, other than to see the cert. It was all invalid certs. So, um, so that's problematic. Um, now, I was going to jump at this point over to my wireless network and show you the decrypted traffic from TrickBot. It, now, I will pause for a moment and see if there's any questions and ask if, if uh, is this your, this your laptop, right? Can, yeah, no, can you, would you mind coming up here and connecting me to my wireless? And so, questions, yes? So, TrickBot is uh, your own uh, proprietary software that you have to do 
No, no, TrickBot is a piece of malware that's created by someone, we don't know who that person is, and, uh, and TrickBot is, we are decrypting the TrickBot command and control traffic using this technique. So the, the access point is, it's this 743EA. And uh, here, I'll let you process it. Yeah. So did everybody catch the, the question was, uh, is, the, is TrickBot the tool that I'm using? And, it, and no, it is not. Yes. Well, I wouldn't say that it actually. So the question is, uh, why does it, why is a why is a self signed cert less secure than a pin cert? Is that is that essentially? Well, it, uh, okay. So um, let me step back and just reiterate. So I, I wouldn't say that it's more secure. That one is not more secure than the other. But I think having some certificate validity f being issued by a, a valid CA where it can be checked. Um, and that there's some trust there is better than having a self-signed cert. That's not to say that the self-signed certs are inherently insecure or that there's some problem with them, um, but, it, but this vil validity checking only happens when it's been done through a certificate authority. I'm sorry, hang on one second. I want to make sure that I can get online. It says it's not connected. It's still it's still trying to connect to it. It, it won't until it's connected. It's not going to work. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. I'm sorry. Would you would you please repeat your question? Okay, so the question is, um, so if, the, if, if they're using a purchased cert instead of a, uh, a self-signed cert, um, w why should I trust the purchased cert more? Um, I don't know, it just, I like, to, I like to be able to make sure that it's legit. Um, it's too, I think it's too easy to kind of clone an app and modify it and add your own self-signed cert in there to kind of pretend to be the app and maybe put it on an app store. Um, having that having that be a valid cert at least gives you the the um, confidence that when it's talking back to its command and control server that it's it's talking back to a command and control server that has at least um, you know proposed to a valid signing authority that they are the real deal, right? So like if you're using your Chase Bank app, I want to make sure that that cert is valid that it's talking to Chase and that it's not just a fake Chase Bank app that's talking to some other guy. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't necessarily make it inherently more secure communications, but it makes me feel better about using it. Yes? That, that is a valid point and I will repeat that. Um, so if the app is itself signed by the, and, the, and the code is signed so that you know that the, uh, the app is, is uh, reputedly uh, originating with the real developer, um, that obviates the need for checking the cert. And, and yeah, that's actually a valid point and one that I hadn't considered. I, I don't, so my, my focus in this talk was just very, very narrowly on the network side of things. Um, and not looking at the, the apps themselves. Um, him and then you. Uh, so do I know about Google's uh, certificate transparency? I, I haven't heard it, the news about it, so um, I, I, do, I do know that um, 
uh, Google's certs and the, and the way that they do SSL specifically within Chrome, they're, they're very on the cutting edge of um, trying to defeat tools like SSL visibility. So they were uh, some of the earliest adopters of some of the uh, uh, really uh, obscure and, and hard to decrypt uh, protocols that were being used. And so um, I would say that the, it, when it comes to the team that's doing the development and management of the SSL visibility product, 95% of their like feature requests is, oh, Google Chrome just added a new like, you know, certificate, you know, or, or new encryption uh, rule that they need to be able to decrypt and like suddenly it's not working anymore. So like I think four times last year they came out with a new version of Chrome and all of a sudden everything broke in SSLV. So then, then a new version of SSLV's firmware had to be uploaded and, you know, reinstalled and, um, and th there's a lot of time that we spend trying to bust into Google stuff. Hi, go ahead. <laughs> wow, that's uh, so it's not a stupid question, but it's not a simple answer. I mean, it, it, essentially what it's doing is um, you, you have a certificate handshake that comes in and is presented what, uh, to, essentially to the client. The SSLV looks for that handshake, it then it then takes that certificate for the handshake, it pretends that it's the client and ha does the handshake back to the server, but then internally within the SSLV, it it's, takes the decrypted traffic, re-encrypts it with, its, with that cert that it's generated, and then sends that up to the client. So it's doing this kind of like half, two, two halves of the whole. Yeah. The decrypted traffic is happening inside of the SSLV box itself. So it's, it's pretend, basically the box pretends to be the client. It pre presents itself as the client. As being, being the client's like originating, you know, box basically. And, and so it does the handshaking and then instead of that, you know, normally that decrypted data would be then, you know, sent into the browser itself and rendered on the screen. Instead, it shunts that out of a decrypted port on the box and then it will re-encrypt it with the certs that you've created and then send that up to the endpoint that actually made the request in the first place. Yes? So, uh, I work for a company that uh, manufactures web building software and uh, we connect to various uh, technical gateways and stuff like that and obviously we do this over TLS and uh, we uh, found in um, uh, general building operating systems including the Cisco OS and Red Hat and whatnot uh, is that um, a lot of different uh, versions of these OS uh, have their own uh, storages. Uh, they get outdated and they are never updated mm -hmm. so Yes. Uh, we have constant problems of people saying that uh, I cannot connect to uh, PayPal uh, version gateway. What do I do? Uh, and we say the problem is not ours. Update your operating system. Well, they have a ton of reasons not to do this. Uh, are there any industry efforts to reduce this fragmentation in the root TA storages and uh, kind of bring everybody to, so that they have the latest uh, root TAs and uh, we can safely do the deploy our software without customers killing us? Okay, so it's a long question and I've got like less than five minutes and I think we're out of time for the demo so I'll just, I'll answer this question and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, the question was, if I, if I got it correctly, there are a lot of different certificate authority stores in different operating systems and even in say, say like a Windows, you can have, there's a certificate authority store for the operating system but if you have Java installed, it has its own CA store. If you have Firefox installed, it has its own separate CA store. If you have Thunderbird installed, that's a third one. If you have Chrome, it has a fourth one. And believe me, I know this because I have to install those CA certs in every one of those stores and it's a giant PITA. So the question was, is there any kind of industry move to like centralize this and keep those certificate stores up to date and have one place where all that stuff is collected? And I think the answer is hell no because they don't want they don't want it that way. I think Chrome, you know, the Chrome developers and Google want their own store because they don't inherently trust the one on the operating system. Um, and the same is probably true for, I can't speak for the people at Mozilla Foundation, but like the reason why Thunderbird has its own store that's separate from the operating system is that they want to make sure that their CA store is accurate and, and they're responsible for updating it when you download your updates, right? That's, that store gets updated periodically with different certs. Um, or, or, you know, sometimes they get deleted, right? So like if you lose trust in WoSign, you can go into those CA stores and delete the WoSign cert and then that kind of reduces the trust that you have in WoSign. Um, it would be nice for there to be one place where you can just do all of that stuff and honestly, like, it's the biggest 
difficulty in my daily job of having to work with this stuff is having to put the certs in all those stores, especially because I have six certs that I install in every machine. Um, so, but no, I don't think that that's going to be a problem that gets solved anytime soon. I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I, I wish I could end on a happier note. I really wanted to show you guys the TrickBot stuff, but you know what? I'll just pitch it as a talk for next year. Are there any other, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, so, free and open source, man in the middle stuff. So, yeah, so um, I know that some exist. I've never used them. I, I know that we're not the only, we're not the only commercial and we're not the only like free product that, that does this, right? And that there are products out there that can do this. And there's also, uh, you know, I think uh, Symantec's antivirus and Kaspersky's antivirus also can intercept SSL so that they can check the reputation on URLs that you visit when you're, when you're using your computer. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for like what's a good al free alternative for this. If you find one though, come and get my card and at the end of the talk and let me know what it is because I'd like to play with it and see what we can do with it. Uh, it's called SSL visibility and if anybody wants to come and see, it's running behind the screen here so if anyone wants to see it I'll, I'll have it out in the hallway afterwards. All right, yeah. I think, I think we're out of time so, oh, is it, do we have time for one more? Okay, yeah. Okay. Right, okay, so that's a really good, the question is, um, th because this thing is so critical on a network, um, screwing it up could really mess up your network. So how do, what do we do to kind of mitigate that and, and reduce the, the attack surface of the device? So um, one of the things that we do, wow, one of the things that we do is um, there, there's, a, uh, there's an administrative interface that can be uh, connected to a completely different VLAN or a different, different segment of the network. Um, and, and that basically can be in like a secured part of the network. Uh, the security analytics box as well, like it will tap the, the active part of the network, but it's not necessarily connected to that active part of the network. And so when you, when you have an administrative interface that's got a separate ethernet jack, you can put it on something else that's like a much more secured and tight, tightened down segment of the network. It doesn't even have to be connected to the internet, it can just be used for administrative interface. Um, so that, that's basically how we do it. Um, the, the bump in the wire itself that the SSLV represents, like, there's, there's nothing that, that is, uh, and I shouldn't say this, like, definitively, but I am 99% sure that there's nothing that can be interfaced with over that, like, through part of the network. So, all right, I'm getting the hook. So thanks, everybody, for coming, and I appreciate your patience.